hyped up because, you know, you are really, you are getting Mr. WCW potentially, you know, arguably the, the greatest hill at that time. And yeah. we know how Vince McMahon loved to build some sort of monster, something like Sergeant Slaughter, you know, anything to go against these big, baby face that was pretty much wrestlemania was pretty much booked like that for such a while now um and and that's how they kind of went with it um so obviously he brought the belt over and they kind of earlier early on uh, when they established him as you know he'd, he'd call himself the real world's champion correct um one of the things i've got to say that i liked the fact that they did is they partnered him with bobby the brain heenan who was quote unquote a financial advisor for Ric Flair at that time, and he, he would even have an executive consultant in Mr. Perfect. Mr. Perfect. So um, a, 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 those three together, just you know, you you couldn't write it, could you? That's just absolutely, yeah. dare I say it, perfect. Which uh, made perfect sense because obviously, you you know, it's, it's a kind of a shame because obviously, Arn the, the Brainbusters, you know, Arn Anderson, they were there at one time, but obviously yeah. they didn't get the, the Horseman, they got Ric Flair, so you needed to have something with him. And it made perfect sense, Bobby Heenan, who had had a long history of managing guys, especially up against Hogan at WrestleMania. I mean, he, that, that sort of went on for a long time True. and he, he, you know, arguably one of the greatest managers. And now you've got like two incredible speakers with each other that I don't think we've really seen since I would say punk and like Heyman. I, I relate a lot to that, like two amazing speakers. A lot of times you put a manager with someone because the wrestler maybe aren't too great on the mic and it might be sort of a, a comfort thing. But in this instance, you've got two incredible speakers together and you get absolute gold whenever they're on because they're almost like there's competitiveness between them. Who You know, who's going to get the, the little lines in? How funny are they? They really rub off each other. And I felt the chemistry with Heenan and Flair was was perfect. But the um, thing that I find fascinating, John, is that Ric Flair, as we said, is already an accomplished promo guy, brilliant yeah. on the stick, didn't really need a, a, a manager. But his pairing with, with Bobby Heenan made mm-hmm. sense, despite yeah. the fact that he didn't need someone to do the promos for him. Yeah. Um, but, but that almost didn't kind of impact Flair in a negative way at all uh, because it almost allowed him, allowed him to kind of, you know, be a different type of Ric Flair and stand in the background when Heenan or Perfect mm-hmm. was doing their piece mm-hmm. of the camera and Ric Flair would be there kind of, you know, bouncing up and down, big smile on his face, patting yeah. about and then, you know, say what you had to say. So it was kind of like the perfect storm, really, between mm-hmm. those three, um, or, despite the fact that Ric Flair didn't need anybody else, but the fact that he did have these extra two bodies with him uh, in the brain and Mr perfect it complemented the act and made it even more larger than life just to play devil's advocate here um and i was thinking about this earlier before we 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 shot this but do you think that vince mcmahon or the hierarchy at wwf they had any they had doubts that maybe rick flair although he was the star of wcw you know vince mcmahon lives in his bubble of wwf very much do you think that they had doubts that rick flair would jump ship and maybe not have that star presence in the WWF oh, absolutely. Uh, audience. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, maybe, I mean, because having Bobby Heenan in it does give a little bit more clout to Ric Flair as a performer. You know, he, yeah. he can do less is more kind of um, part two. Do you think that that ever happened? Or do you think that's, you know, at the time Ric Flair was a, a known entity, you know, regardless? Well, I mean, this is a really interesting point. I think it actually kind of, tells you a lot when we get into the story of WrestleMania 8 as well with regards mm-hmm. to Vince McMahon and maybe the, the faith that he had in the Ric sure. Flair character thinking well you know I've got my big kind of baby face superhero in Hulk Hogan and mm-hmm. uh, maybe he saw him as just the guy from the south the guy from the competition um, mm-hmm. despite the fact that he was kind of knocking it out of the park every time he was on the TV the, the thing that I quite found really really intriguing and, and uh, this was something that WWF never did up until here they was kind of breaking their own fourth wall in having mm-hmm. Ric Flair there having the big gold belt now I know that they blurred it out on the original uh, superstars or primetime whatever it was whenever Flair was there with the big gold belt they blurred it out on TV so they didn't actually show it or maybe show the logo um, but I because I, I 
have it on reasonable authority that WWF that Vince Man tried to sign Ric Flair um, mm-hmm. a few years earlier, I think possibly yep. around about uh, 88, 89. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that there were, you know, they were close to signing, but Ric Flair decided to stay with mm-hmm. WCW. But, yep. uh, but I mean, you, you touched on it earlier, John, and Ric Flair was going for a really, really hard time around about 1990, 1991. And I know that they wanted him, they wanted to, the new management, I think it was Jim Hurd, wanted to, to repackage yeah. Ric Flair. Um, and they wanted to cut his hair short, which he did eventually anyway, but mm-hmm. uh, they wanted to repackage him in some sort of like gladiator yeah. type <laughs> character. And, um, you know, I think Jim Hurd was the type of guy that was thinking, was trying to copy some of the things that, Rick, uh, that Vince McMahon was doing. So mm-hmm. successfully with the WWF, instead of focusing on what made the NWA and WCW so popular, and that was more the in-ring action as opposed to the the big costumes and the big characters. Yeah. So, and I think Ric Flair's confidence level went through the floor, and that's when uh, I think he got fired. Um, but you know, the reason why he showed up on WWF with the big gold belt is because he paid what like a twenty-five thousand uh, dollar deposit um, that mm-hmm. all champions right. would have to pay yeah. to have the belt. Um, and then they would get that deposit paid back to them when they lost the championship. Well, when they fired him, they forgot to um, either get him to drop the title or forgot to take the belt off of him. So that's mm-hmm. why he was claiming the belt to be his own when he first appeared on WWF TV. Um, yep. But, um, you know, I, going back to your original question, I think there probably may have been some doubts. Um, and maybe that's the reason why they aligned him with Bobby Heenan. So that you've got um, a, a trusted veteran Mm-hmm. You know, that's familiar with the WWF audience that sure. can maybe help to introduce Ric Flair as a character because Ric Flair going in cold might have fallen on its ass, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. um, with WWF being more of a family orientated product, maybe aimed more at kids, we sh- could say, maybe yep. aimed more at the, the wrestling fan that liked the characters. So if Ric Flair went in as Ric Flair, as this kind of, you know, dare I say it, uh, more of a, an ordinary type character compared to your Undertakers or your Hulk Hogan's or your, mm-hmm. your Berserkers or whatever. Um, it probably needed the brain there to help introduce him to that audience before he could kind of find his feet with the fans, I suppose, because it's a totally different fan base. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, and yeah, I mean, at the time, I mean, the, the exposure of WCW wasn't as big as WWF, especially globally, um, I would say. But we really? certainly had heard of it in the UK. But uh, I mean, at the time, I, I've got to say, when I was a younger fan, I saw WCW and WWF as equal. I don't know why. I just that was my perception that there was one wasn't bigger than the other. The only difference was that one had WrestleMania and the other didn't. That was a big thing. And I, you know, I sort of the WrestleMania was keyed in to me that that was the biggest show. So you want to get on the biggest stage. That's where you've got to go. But other than that, I, for the most part, although they, you know, when you look back at it, they're completely different styles. They're completely different. The way they promote them is completely different. But uh, watching it as a fan back then, especially as a kid, I I have to say I was, I didn't ever think one was bigger than the other. So I always thought they was equal, just on different, battling on different platforms as it was. Um, And, you know, I I always saw Ric Flair, he is the WCW guy and Hulk Hogan is, is the, the good guy, baby face. And it's also worth pointing out, if we were talking about this as a territory or as a promotion on that, WCW had, had had this, probably their DNA, obviously, was from NWA, which yeah. had very much had guys predominantly champions that were heel. Um, I think it's fair to say. A lot sure. of the wrestlers yeah. would always go up against the heel, and, and they would have some long runs with those. I mean, Ric Flair, obviously, <clears throat> we know he was a massive uh, Buddy Rogers fan the original nature boy yeah. and he, he was particularly the same it, it, you had guys like that i mean another guy that had that sort of persona was nick buttwinkle yeah. if you ever remember he, he was also with heenan as well and, and that's why i actually think the chemistry here works because uh nick buttwinkle and and heenan also both of them were great speakers as well um but they really played off each other nicely but i predominantly wcw had, had they were kind of trying to go a different route, I guess, with Sting, the surface Sting. They were trying to get that to a little bit more buzz. And then, as you say, they kind of went into this sport theme as well, where they didn't want to do the over-the-top stuff. So they wanted to go a little bit more a different way. But that had been considered the heel 
territory, if you will. And WWF, since WrestleMania had mm-hmm. been, this is the feel-good moment. We send you home with a smile, you know, especially the big payoffs in this. We're going to make sure that you get that. Um, you know, if, if anything, Babyface versus Babyface have been the closest thing we'd seen um, with Warrior and Hogan. And I don't think they quite enjoyed having the crowd uh, maybe as split as they thought. But um, coming into that, like the, the, you, you've got to think to yourself, is Ric Flair in the WWF side going to work um, because of, of, of the structure? Do, do you think that played any massive part? Or do you think that Ric Flair at this time, he knew he had to get out of WCW. He knew, maybe he had doubts about himself, like you said, and he's got to go somewhere to prove himself again, that he can adapt and, and fit in this other world. But a promotion predominantly that, that feeds to baby faces rather than heels. Yeah, and I, I think that it was the right time for Flair to take the jump and move mm-hmm. over to uh, WWF at the time. I think uh, uh, he was unhappy from what I understand uh, around that era. We've already explained that they tried to get him to change uh, character, look, gimmick. Um, and yeah, I, I think it was the perfect time. And Ric Flair has even gone on record as to say that that, that kind of first year or product, because I think he left WWF around 93. Three. So just before yep. WrestleMania yep. 9, I believe, around about mm-hmm. March, yep. uh, did he lose a, a loser leaves match to Ric Flair, to Mr. Perfect on a Monday Night Raw, yep. um, uh, around about um, March time, uh, 93. So he's only with WWE for maybe a year and a half. Yeah, um, but, but but he went on record as to say that during that time, he, he, had, he had a fantastic time, he really, really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Um, the way he was introduced to the company, he was kind of thrown in right at the top. You know, uh, mm-hmm. he had a, a bit of a, a mini feud with Roddy Piper, who had also yep. been a, a long time rival of Ric Flair's in mm-hmm. other territories. Um, and, uh, you know, going in straight you know, into a big feud with Hogan as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to get to this first watch along that we're going to do now. Um, and obviously I, I want to encourage all our listeners to, fire up their wwe network i'm going to give you where to go how to find this because it is a little bit of a a struggle if you're not familiar with wwe network um you want to basically go to old school wwf i think that's what it's called uh, which is under in ring Uh, go on there and uh, basically if you click on the year if you go down to 91 I think it's actually the second one down anyway. Yeah, it's near, it's near the there, top. There wasn't. Yeah. Um, it's November 30th, 1991. You'll see Madison Square Garden. And basically, this was like a, a massive um, house show. They would do these a lot back then. They stopped doing this. This is actually like they done one more after this. And then there was like a big gap. They didn't really run, at least that were televised like this. Um, but although it was televised, it wasn't televised. Um, I don't think this went out everywhere. So this was very much like a, you remember Madison Square Garden TV? They had like their own TV channel for a while. I think they got the exclusives to this uh, for a long while after. So um, here we have the first of two matches that they had. This one is the only one on the WWE Network, um, which I'm pleased they've left this one on there because this is the one that I'd heard the most about from people that were working in WWE at the time um, that were watching this. Um, So, yeah, go literally to in-ring and then you want WWF old school, head down to Madison Square Garden, November 30th, 1991. And then the time uh, you want to scroll to, uh, skip to, because it's not right at the end, believe it or not. (laughs) This is the era we're living in here. Uh, This is 25 minutes and uh, 25 minutes and 14 seconds let's uh, head there so 25 minutes 14 seconds guys pause the podcast while you do that then click the play button after and, and you would have found it um and on the count of one we're gonna do this one john so uh, we're, we're heading back to 91 in the time Sounds machine good. here uh, so here we go 25 minutes 13 seconds um three two one and here we go. So you should see a nice, uh, well, say nice, <laughs> basic kind of uh, Hogan versus Flair image should should show up there. Here we are, John. Um, Madison Square yeah. Garden. Couldn't have picked a better place to have the first match, I guess, between these two if you were going to do it. Um, obviously, loads of history here. This is very much WWF time. Um, you would say like Madison Square Garden very much cemented. Now, the interesting thing here with New York fans, John, as you know, probably as well as I do, 
um, they have a different they have a different um, set of eyes. They, they really know what they like and they really tell you what they dislike. Yeah, um, it's a different kind of audience. Even back here, it 